This is Doug Halma Agne Karl Hammerskot. He was the Secretary General of the United Nations from 10 April 1953 to 1961. Then he met his death in a plane crash. And um, he was the fourth son of the Prime Minister of Sweden during the years of World War I. He was the first one. Now, what did he do in the United Nations? Well, one of the first things he did was to produce or create a prayer room. And there it is on the left-hand side. Uh, a stone in the middle of the room was placed to tell us we may see it as an altar, empty, not because there is no God, not because it is an altar to an unknown God, but because it is dedicated to the God who man worships under many names and many forms. Very interesting. So there is this prayer room with only this stone altar, which is built to be shaped like a... Like a, a rectangle if you like which has certain interesting meanings and the whole building the whole room has the shape of a trapezoid now what does that mean well there's also an all-seeing eye and that symbol that we see over here in the, amongst the Hittites is also the symbol if you look carefully of the United Nations which has the laurel wreath and which has the face up there which is just replaced with the earth Now you can turn any outlet into a source of heat. Hulk heater is energy efficient. It draws little power compared to other heating alternatives and just costs pennies a day to run. Hulk heater heats up to 250 square feet and is lightweight, weighing only 1.25 pounds. Hulk heater is electronic testing laboratories listed. Get prepared for the cold winter ahead and get 42% off with the purchase of three heaters today. Now, perhaps the best way to comprehend what the all-seeing eye represents is to examine the architecture of the meditation room of the United Nations building in New York. The meditation room is shaped as a pyramid, a trapezoid. Without the capstone, inside the room is dimly lit, but coming from the ceiling is a narrow but concentrated pinpoint beam of light which radiates down to a bleak stone altar. On the wall straight ahead is a breathtaking modernistic mural that is dynamically endowed with occult symbolism. Containing 27 triangles and various configurations, a mixture of black and white and colored background and a snake-like vertical line, at the center is the all-seeing eye, which grips the millions of annual UN visitors with its stark beckoning image of suspicion and omnipresence. This is the quote from Tex Mars. And some more quotes. The meditation room faces north, northeast. To enter the room, one must proceed from darkness into light. Indeed, the middle order of the Satanic Brotherhood is called the Order of the Trapezoid. That's very interesting. And Anton LeVay, who is the founder of the Church of Satan, refers to an occult principle known as the law of the trapezoid. So we seem to have a very occult room here, which is dedicated to a god that can be served under any name. Hmm. The one that I know has one name. First, before that, we have the Cry for Peace coming up October 23rd through the 25th. And why does it look like a Colosseum? Hmm, let's find out because this is happening in Rome. They're talking about this, a prayer service for peace at Rome's Colosseum where Christians were martyred. The Vatican re confirmed yesterday, Tuesday, that the Pope Francis will join other religious leaders at a prayer service. This is an interreligious prayer summit for three days and representatives of the world's major religions will take part in the prayer service and conference talking about peace and everything they're doing. And even the service there, the interreligious prayer service from 4.30 to 6 p.m. at the Colosseum, the famous monument is believed by some historians to be a site of early Christian martyrdom. Now, why would they talk about Christian martyrdom except for Revelation 6 seal that's coming up? When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were was completed. For our sin of omission, the 10 plus 1 
climate commandments. You know, this is just an opinion, but one of them is to keep the Sabbath. The missions are down 30% over the Sabbath every week in Israel and are almost zeroed out on Yom Kippur, the most Jewish high holy day of the year. The a global weekly non-carbon day could reduce emissions of the world by one-seventh, per, you know, one-seventh and can be observed by different faith communities on different days. How's that going to work? To permanently bend the emissions curve, every nation has needs to step up. We're racing forward to do our part to avert the climate hell. Descendants from the tribe of Judah are quite visible to the world today, due mainly to the fact that they have remained faithful to keeping the Sabbath. Jacob foretold this, and his hand shall be the neck of your enemies. The military skill of these people of the modern state of Israel in resisting the attacks of their Arab neighbors has been quite remarkable. This branch of Jacob has always had a reputation for producing great intellects like Einstein as well as being skillful warriors. The Judites in the state of Israel and the Scottish, many of whom descended from Judah, have a reputation as great warriors and inventors. The Judites and Scots also share the common trait of being known for being financially shrewd. In uh, Zephaniah 2, 1 through 2, there appears to be a reference to the return of these people to the land of Palestine that we have seen in recent decades. Jesus' prophecy of the abomination of desolation requires an Israelite presence in Palestine in the end time. A significant number of this tribe migrated into Europe with the other tribes. The Jutes gave the name of Jutland to the Danish peninsula. Many from this ancient tribe can also be found in Denmark, Scotland, South England, North Ireland, as well as the United States. Judah's brother Dan was described as a serpent by the way or a serpent's trail. These conquerors had a custom of naming places after their tribal ancestor, Dan. They left their mark on Europe as they migrated across it. We see this in the names of many of Europe's important rivers, such as the Don, Dnieper, Dniester, Dornelis, and the Danube. Keating's History of Ireland traces the Tuatha de Danann literally the tribe of Dan, from Greece to Ireland and Scandinavia. Both Scandinavia and Sweden bear the name of Dan. The name of Dan occurs frequently in Ireland in places in the like the Donegal, the Danslaw, the Dungarvan, Dundalk, Dunglo, Dunsmore, as well as the popular Irish song Danny Boy. Dan migrated to Ireland and, along with people descended from the Jutes, Judah, formed the bulk of the nation of Denmark, Danmark. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. Jacob also said that Dan would be a judge over his own people. Ireland has been like a serpent biting at the hills to England. Ireland achieved self-government from British rule via a terrorist campaign against representatives of the British government. A coiled snake is also the symbol of the Irish Republican Army. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Judges 18.30 tell this story. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges 17.6 The pagan people of Dan set out conquering land throughout the steppes of Russia and throughout Europe. One illustrious region of importance conquered by Dan was the Greek island of Zakynthos. The island of Zakynthos is steeped in history dating back to before records began. 
Zikitos even plays a part in ancient Greek mythology and is mentioned in the old Western text ever discovered. Zante was said to have originally been called Hiri and was so renamed after the first settler, Zakintos, son of King Dardanus. The beautiful island has been conquered and changed hands many time, uh, times over the years due to its luscious resources and strategic location in the Mediterranean. Long before there were human settlers, Hiri was the paradise of the mythological gods. Enchanted by the beauty of the island, twins Art Art Artemis and Apollo, they were known to have loved this area as well. The various royal houses of English history, the Saxons, Danes, Normans, Tudors, Stuarts, Plantagenets, Hanoverans, sax Coburgs all lines blended and fused with Scottish royalty to form the modern House of Windsor, trace their bloodlines back to a common ancestor. Indeed, the various monarchs of Europe, as attested to in the medieval Viking sagas and histories, the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, and pedigree after pedigree of every European royal lineage are all traced back to the same person. To the Germans, he was known as Wotan. To the Anglo-Saxons, Woden. To the Norse and other Scandinavians, he was known by the name by which he is still commonly referred to as today, Odin. Yet Odin is, of course, the chief god of the Teutonic pantheon known as the Aesir, who lived at the supposedly mythological Valhalla, or Hall of the Chosen, in Asgard, considered the Norse version of heaven. Odin was a king who lived around Azov before being driven out by the Romans and taking his followers to Sweden. Ancient metal belt holders, rings, and armbands dating from 100 to 200 AD found in excavations around the mouth of the Don River were almost identical to Viking equivalents found in Gotland, Sweden, some 800 years later. In ancient times, people treated gods and kings as one and the same thing. Many people of ancient Greece and western Turkey were of the Israelite tribe of Dan. In the two Babylons compiled by Alexander Hislop, the author tells us that from the researches of Humboldt, we find that the Mexicans celebrated Woden as the founder of their race, just as our ancestors did. The Odin of Scandinavia can be proven to be the same as the Woden of Mexico, continues Hislop. This is the spirit of the philosophy of the United Nations. Interesting. It is a law of the universe that in all things there is prior existence. Before every form there is a prior but lesser evolved form. Each one of us is evolving towards Godhead. So we are all becoming God. Wonderful philosophy. What I'm proposing to do is to narrow that gap between pantheism and Christianity by bringing out what one might call the Christian soul of pantheism or the pantheist aspect of Christianity. That's fascinating. So God is in everything. God is not a separate entity. We ourselves are God or part of God. If you are a pantheist, that's what you believe. I can be saved only by becoming one with the universe. That's pantheism. It's also the philosophy of Buddhism. I believe the Messiah whom we await, whom we all without any doubt await, is the universal Christ, that is to say the Christ of evolution. Right, that's Teilhard de Chardin's philosophy. Isn't that interesting? So, unfortunately, I cannot agree with one single iota of that philosophy. It's not biblical. In fact, it's blasphemous. A general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfied them all. That's what Teilhard de Chardin said. Christianity and evolution. This is his quote. His quote. 
So a convergence of religion that satisfies them all. And he saw the United Nations as the embodiment of this philosophy. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. That means everybody must come together. Now how do you get all the religions to come together and to bury the hatchets and their differences? You create a pain of separation, chaos, that exceeds the pain of unity. Is that understandable? That's how you do it. That's Hegelian philosophy. That is Freemason philosophy. So today we're in the pain stage, and the next phase will be unity or un inexplicable pain. That's the choice. And mankind will quite readily choose which one. The lesser pain, obviously, to survive. The fact that that name had been born by some illustrious hero among the supposed ancestors of the Mexican race is put beyond all doubt by the singular circumstance that the Mexicans had one of their days called Odin's Day, exactly as the Scandinavians. The Mayas claimed that their kingdom was founded by a great eastern ruler named Odin or Votan or Dan by some of their tribes. And according to legend, he was a white man who came by sea from the east, bringing an infusion of new people to their land. Ten centuries before the time of Christ, notes the historian Ordinez. This Votan, who was also worshipped as a god, was famous for having himself journeyed to a land where a great temple was being built. Do we have a king in Europe living at the same time Solomon's temple was being built around 1000 BC? Who had dominion over the seas? Who was worshipped as a god? And whose name sounded like Votan? Yes. Woden, our Odin, king of Denmark from 1040 to 999 BC. He was worshipped later as a great god. Scandinavian literature is replete with accounts of his distant journeys which took him away from his homeland for many months and even sometimes years. Odin often appears with two other gods either his brothers Vili or V or Loki and Honir. Apollo is the odd one out here, literally since he never appears as anything but a singular god. In the Interpretatio Romano, Celtic gods associated with the arts were compared to Apollo. Among his many skills, he could play the harp and sing, and one of his names was Ildanak, skilled in many arts. Odin, too, is the god of poets, having gone to considerable trouble to get the mead of poetry. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Revelation 9.11 Apollo, the god of light and music, represented as a sun god, was courageous and strong. He was famed for being tall and handsome and for his many acts of bravery. It is said that he had once slain a dragon which had plagued the religious center of Delphi. Apollo was also known for his love of women, and it is said that Apollo used his charm to seduce nymphs and maidens by the hundred. One such maiden, Daphne, wished to save her virtues and was so horrified by the attentions of Apollo that she begged her father to turn her into a tree. A little over the top, perhaps, but it was effective. Apollo's twin was his sister, Artemis. Artemis was the goddess of the moon and the hunt. Unlike Apollo, Artemis valued her virtue and begged Zeus to allow her to remain unmarried. She spent her time wandering the forest with deer and the other fa wild fauna. Artemis 
was known to be a pleasant young lady, although like most women, she did have a temper and was to prove the downfall of a young man named Arctean. While out hunting, Arctean had chanced upon the naked Artemis, bathing in a pool deep in the forest. To prevent Actian from telling what he had seen, Artemis turned the young man into a stag. When he caught a glimpse of his reflection in the water, he ran away. This caused his very own hounds to chase him down and tear him to pieces. Also, despite her virginity, Artemis is often depicted as a symbol of fertility among the pagan and is seen as the protector of women during childbirth. Generally considered the oldest literature ever discovered, Zakynthos is mentioned in the text written by ancient Greek storyteller Homer. There is still much discussion about the true age of the papyrus text. In Greek mythology, Hiri was renamed after the island founder Zakynos, who was the son of the legendary Arcadian king Dardanus. Zara ben Judah and Electra, the granddaughter of Tubal Cain, were married in a religious ceremony in Crete. They had a son named Dardonus. Dardonus was born in 1710 BC in Canaan, and he died in 1610 BC. Is there a connection to these two? It is said that Dardonus brought his fleet from the city of Cephisa and made his way to the island and founded this Greek Acropolis. Legend says that Zakynthos made coins and symbols of the island. The symbols and imagery were of himself holding a snake, as according to these legends, he had rid the island of all its snakes. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's hill, so that his rider shall fall backward. Zakintos, as it is now known, was then conquered by Archesius, the king of Cephalonia, and then Ulysses, the king of Ithaca. Ulysses now had Zakintos, and he took vessels from across his lands and headed into the war of Troy, quoted by Homer in the ancient text Iliad. Zakintos is also mentioned in the second of the ancient text, the Odyssey. Homer mentions 20 nobles from Zakintos among a total of 108 of Penelope's suitors. In Odyssey, Homer also refers to a rebellion in the Ionian Islands that put an end to the power of Ulysses, and for the first time, the Zakintos had the right to a democratic government to be free. Zakintos allied themselves with the Athenians during the Peloponnesian War 459 and 446 B.C., after the war, this alliance became very profitable for the Athenians as they used another of Zante's natural resources for their ships. At the bottom of the Kerry Lake, there is a naturally formed deposit of tar. This tar was the most effective agent of the time to be protecting the ship's planking. Perhaps this is where the family of the tribe of Dan became expert seafarers. The land assigned to the tribe of Dan was in western Canaan. Noteworthy among the cities are Zora, Eshtel, Temna, Ajalon, and Ekron, which is found in the cuneiform inscriptions of the Amkaruna. On the north, the territory of Dan ended opposite Joppa, the modern Jaffa, this territory, not very extensive originally, was soon diminished by its dangerous neighbors, the Philistines. It is not surprising, therefore, that the Danites had great difficulty in conquering the country that had been assigned to them. Accordingly, they sent a deputation to find a district suitable for the reception of a part of the tribe. This was found in the vicinity of the city of Laish. Another indication that the tribe of Dan was harassed is found in the sentence in Judges 5.17. Why did Dan remain in ships? This probably had reference to the fact that members of the tribe of Dan had enlisted on the ships of the Phoenicians. 
The distress of Dan increased when toward the end of the period of the Israelitish judges, the Philistines, receiving reinforcements from their former home, endeavored to invade the middle territories of Canaan. Then help arose for Dan in the person of the hero Samson, whose work was brilliantly continued by Samuel and then by David and other kings. This explains why the tribe of Dan is mentioned in the accounts of David and Solomon and in later times. The later designation for the Canaanite city Laish or Lisham, the city lay in a deep valley near Beth Ruab on the northern frontier of Palestine at the place where men come to Hamath. According to Josephus, it was not far from the sources of the Lesser Jordan, three or four Roman miles from Phineas. In the book of Enoch, it is said that Dan lay south of the western side of Mount Hermon, originally inhabited by Canaanites. It was captured by a part of the tribe of Dan, whose territory in southwestern Palestine was invaded by the Philistines and who named it after their tribal ancestor. The mention of the name of Dan as early as the time of Abraham and Moses is therefore anticipated by the later chronicler. The place seems to be identical with Danjuan, which was situated east of the lake of Genesaret towards Sidon, and as this was the route in which Laish Dan lay, it is probable that Danjuan is a corruption of Dan's war. Dan in the wood, and that this was merely an occasional destination of the city of Dan. The place is often mentioned in the phrases, from Dan even to Beersheba, and from Beersheba even to Dan, and is also mentioned as a northern frontier town of Palestine. Dan is also referred to in connection with the ritual, according to Judges 1831, A graven image stood there up to the time of the destruction of the sanctuary at Shiloh, which which sanctuary is mentioned for the last time in 1 Samuel 4.12. Jeroboam I set up at Dan one of the two golden calves which he intended as symbols for Yahweh. Many persons of northern tribes of Israel, therefore, made pilgrimages to Dan, but the city soon fell into the hands of Israel's northern enemies. A hill near the valley in which lay the ancient city of Dan is today called Talakadi, otherwise known as Hill of the Judge, the name being perhaps a reminiscence of the name Dan, which means judge. Dan plays a peculiar role in rabbinical tradition. Owing to the fact that his name, as the name of a tribe, is connected with the blasphemer and with the idolatry of northern Israel, while Samson, the judge of the tribe of Dan, proved faithless to his Nazarite, Dan came to be regarded as the black sheep of the house of Jacob. His hatred of Joseph, because he brought to his father evil reports against the sons of Billa and Zilba, induced him to plot against Joseph's life, and he advised the brothers to deceive their father by saying that they had found the coat of Joseph dipped in blood. Dan and Gad were in league with the crown prince of Egypt against Joseph and Asenath. As early as the days of Moses, the tribe of Dan worshipped idols, wherefore the pillar of cloud failed to protect it, and consequently Amalek smote Dan, who was the hindmost and feeble because he feared not God. Being the rearward of all the camps, Dan fell a victim to the fire that devoured the uttermost part of the camp because of the idol which provoked the anger of the Lord. It was also Dan's idolatry which induced Balaam to order altar and sacrifices for the defeat of Israel. Dan's idolatry restrained Abraham in his march against the Babylonian kings and appalled Moses in his vision for the future. The children of Dan taught their sons the idolatrous 
Amorite practices contained in the books hidden under Mount Abraham. Jacob's blessing of Dan, in which he is compared to a serpent, is referred to Samson, and the serpent is said to have been made the emblem of the tribe on its standard. But Dan became the very type of evil doing. He was placed to the north, this being the region of darkness and evil, because of his idolatry which wrapped the world in darkness. Still further goes a tradition which identifies the serpent and the lion with Belial. Other church fathers believe that the Antichrist comes from the tribe of Dan and base it on Jeremiah 8.16. The snorting of his, the enemy's, horses was heard from Dan. A verse referred to Dan's idolatry. It is noted that Dan is not mentioned in the Revelation 7, 5, 7 text among the 144,000 saved ones of the 12 tribes, nor is the omission of Dan in 1 Chronicles 4 unintentional. After the end of the 40 days. The final connection to all of this has to be the 40 days. So if you go from November 13th, 40 days, it brings you right to midweek Hanukkah and the winter solstice. Oh, the audacity. So they, they're, they're actually going to go up on God's holy mountain where God told the Israelites, you can't even touch the foot. These people not only are going to touch the mountain, they're going to climb the mountain. And then instead of receiving Ten Commandments from God, they're going to give their own Ten Commandments. 